Welcome to this workshop on how to use a decentralized Bitcoin exchange. My name is Chris Beams. I am one of the co-founders of BISC, the decentralized Bitcoin exchange that we'll be using in the hands-on portion of the workshop. But before we get to that, to the how, let's talk a bit about the what and the why. There's a lot of buzzwords uh, around the notion of decentralized exchange, and it can be pretty easy to lose uh, sight of the forest for the trees and, and lose track of what actually matters. So instead of buzzwords, let's talk about values. What actually matters when we're exchanging our Bitcoin? Well, for sure, security matters. And by security, mean that your funds are safe, right? Privacy, that you control access to your data. And freedom, that you can trade without, in, without interference. That nobody can stop you from making your trade. So let's dig into security a little bit. Security requires non-custodial management of funds. Like we often say in the Bitcoin space, not your keys, not your coins. And while this is widely accepted, fairly widely understood, when it comes to storing our Bitcoin and sending our Bitcoin, uh, that we shouldn't use custodial wallets like hosted Bitcoin wallets, but rather we should keep control of our own keys. It's not so uh, widely understood or it's still all too widely accepted that uh, custodial management of funds is a necessary evil when it comes to exchanging our Bitcoin for fiat money or, uh, or other altcoins, etc. And that's just not the case. As we'll see, properly implemented a decentralized Bitcoin exchange should make it possible for you to stay in complete control of your funds, never relinquishing control to a trusted third party. And we know that the impact of relinquishing control of our keys to trusted third parties results in one hack, one theft after another, an endless litany of stolen funds. So another important aspect of security in a decentralized exchange is security deposits from both counterparties, from both buyer and seller, to ensure their good behavior, to ensure that there's a stick if they don't behave uh, per the protocol of the exchange, right? that payments are made on time, uh, and so on. And that all funds, security deposits, and of course the Bitcoin being traded, are stored in a multi-signature escrow. So on to privacy. First of all, when we're talking about exchanging our Bitcoin, privacy means no KYC. The KYC of course stands for the know your customer laws, part of the so-called Bank Secrecy Act laws that dictate uh, that entities like centralized Bitcoin exchanges and all banks and so on must re record copious amounts of information, unnecessary uh, inf amounts of information about their users uh, in a centralized way, creating honeypots of information that can be stolen and otherwise taken advantage of by uh, hackers and thieves and other forms of crooks. And there's absolutely no benefit for you as a person uh, wanting to engage in trading Bitcoin, in divulging that information is nothing less than doxing yourself. And it's not necessary. It is not required. You can opt out and a properly implemented decentralized Bitcoin exchange should help you do that. Indeed, a properly implemented decentralized Bitcoin exchange should make it impossible for there to be any KYC uh, centralized collection of 
information and so on. Likewise, privacy means local storage of personal data, whether that's your bank account information where you're going to be doing the fiat side of trading or that's your uh, trading history, what have you, that ought to all be stored locally on your own machine. You may want to have that information, you may want to know your trading history, etc. But that information, there's no good reason for anybody else to have that information from your perspective. And when all of that information is centralized, that creates extreme incentives, again, for thefts and hacks. Now, avoiding KYC and, avo and uh, enabling local storage of personal information requires decentralization. All of the exchanges that you see here were at some point in their, in their, uh, from their inception, they were non-KYC exchanges. You could create an account with a username and a password. You didn't have to provide passport selfies and uh, you know all of your personal data and your address and telephone number and all the rest. But because they're centralized entities, because they are run by companies beholden to one or another certain jurisdiction, given enough time, they got coerced. Probably none of these companies wanted to force KYC on their users, but uh, it happened in every case. These and many more. What's required to effectively maintain uh, this resistance to KYC is effective decentralization. To really do that, there must be no company, no jurisdiction, just peer-to-peer -peer software. And here we have the example of local Bitcoins, the famous example of local Bitcoins, which is based in Helsinki. And Finland uh, produced a, a law, the Act on Virtual Currency Service Providers, that dictated that local Bitcoins and any other entity like them must collect KYC inf uh, style information from all of their users. It's just a matter of time. So on to freedom. Freedom means trading what you want, when you want, with whomever you want, without permission. And freedom requires censorship resistance. Many know the famous case of uh, WikiLeaks being banned by Coinbase, right? A Bitcoin exchange, no less. Uh, it, not to mention being blocked by all the major credit card processors like uh, MasterCard and so on. Now, of course, people could still get Bitcoin payments to them because Bitcoin itself is by design censorship resistant. Doesn't matter whether Coinbase or anybody else says that they don't want you sending payments to them. If you own your keys, you can send them to WikiLeaks or anybody you like and nobody can stop you. So that same principle of censorship resistance that is so vital to uh, Bitcoin's uh, ethos and uh, ability to survive in this world is just as important for a decentralized Bitcoin exchange. It must be as difficult as possible uh, for anyone to come along and decide that you shouldn't be able to trade uh, on that exchange using that exchange network. So to achieve the necessary degree of censorship resistance. That requires desktop software and peer-to-peer -peer networking. Websites just won't cut it. Domains can be seized and website operators can be forced to block certain countries, 
certain uh, you know known uh, VPN IP addresses and so on. So these are the things that matter, and it's not so easy to achieve them. As a general principle that ties all of these together, we want to minimize trust. We want to eliminate trusted third parties whenever and wherever we can. Eliminate any choke points that could make it possible for someone to come along and stop that exchange from functioning. So BISC is one project that's made its, its mission uh, doing just that. It's free and open source software. It's built on top of Bitcoin. Uh, and it's, it, it has a custom peer-to-peer -peer network that operates on top of Tor, so inheriting all of Tor's own censorship resistance. And it's not a company. It's not run by a company. It doesn't operate in any jurisdiction whatsoever. It's governed by a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization, what we call the BISC DAO. And BISC is primarily about Bitcoin to fiat uh, exchange. That's the hardest problem of all. Um, trading Bitcoin for other cryptocurrencies or tokens or altcoins or stablecoins or what have you uh, is uh, relatively easy to do uh, because it can be done with uh, atomic swaps and so on. It can be done in a, in a trustless or near trustless way. Uh, but the trading from Bitcoin to fiat problem is indeed a hard problem because it requires that we interact with the legacy financial system one way or the other. And that means interacting with banks. So there's going to be trust involved, um, but it's, it's, it's raison d'etre, right? Like why, why it was built is to solve that problem of getting in and out of uh, fiat in a secure and private uh, and censorship resistant way. So there's, there is also lots of Monero trading on BISC and there's a variety of other altcoins available, but uh, outside of the the, the, the main uh, fiat uh, trading pairs and the Monero pairs, um, every, everything else is small potatoes. So those are the main trading pairs. It's built for those who want the highest degree of control, the highest degree of security, privacy, and freedom when they're trading their Bitcoin. It's also, a great place for market makers, people who want to come along and make their Bitcoin available for sale at uh, you know, a, a, a premium for the service of providing that, that, that liquidity and to make a little profit in the process. So we certainly encourage and have plenty of market makers doing just that on BISC. We give them all the controls that they need to make that possible. But it's not ideal for uh, day traders, algorithmic traders, people who are trying to beat the market, doing lots of trading uh, throughout the, you know, throughout a given day, or uh, just simply expecting to trade very often. It's, the spirit is much more, you know, that this is an exchange built for, uh, you know, r real people who need to get in and out of fiat uh, for, uh, you know, that are privacy oriented, for whatever reason, you know, they need to pay their rent or what have you, or they're looking to uh, just safely accumulate uh, Bitcoin over time, say. So as we get into the hands-on portion of this, we're essentially going to be walking through the steps that you can find at our Getting Started Guide, which is a uh, all-new resource, um, you know, recently uh, revamped, and um, uh, quite quite great to go through. Um, you, you'll be yeah getting it uh, uh, directly here, but it's good to know about this resource as well. So first of all, BISC is desktop software. So the first thing you would do is download it for whatever your platform may be, install it just like any other app, and run it. And you would 
watch it uh, boot up and make its connections and so on and so forth. And when that's finished, you'd land at a screen like this, looking in this case at the BISC offer book. So in a moment, I'll play a uh, recorded demo between myself and another BISC contributor, Steve, where I'm going to exchange, uh, I'm going to sell some of my Bitcoin in exchange for euros uh, because I need to pay my rent. And uh, Steve is going to play the role of a first time BISC user uh, who's looking to buy some Bitcoin and take my trade. But first, let's take a little tour of of BISC, just so you have a sense of what you're looking at in the recorded demo. So again, here we're on the main page of, uh, of the BISC application. And the first thing I want to look at is the trades tab. And here you can see for all of the currency pairs that BISC supports, all the different fiat euro, USD, British pounds, etc., and uh, all of the uh, altcoins that are supported and so on. These are the trades that have been happening over the last day, two days, and on into history. So you can get a sense here, looking at the, at the charts and so on, about how many trades happen per day, what kind of volume of Bitcoin is moving through the exchange. Now, if we look at the market details tab, you can get another kind of overview. So right now there's about 50 Bitcoin total on offer on the platform so that there are open offers that total up to 50 Bitcoin. And that's about 400 offers. So you can see the, the leader there with the, in terms of number of offers is Euro trades. So keep in mind that one, one side of every trade on BISC is Bitcoin, right? So these would be trade, these would be offers to buy or sell Bitcoin for Euro. Euro and USD are nearly always at the top, right? And then quickly thereafter, we see Monero trades and on down the line. You see that things fall off pretty steeply after that. So it's really these kind of top 10 trading pairs that, uh, that make up the, the lion's share of trading on BISC. Now, let's say, like I'm going to do in, my, uh, in, in the demo that you're about to see, that I want to sell some Bitcoin. So I would click on that Sell Bitcoin tab, and now I'm looking at the list of all the uh, existing offers that other people have made that I could take. Oh, excuse me. Let's drill down first and let's look at Euro trades. So let's filter by Euro. We're in uh, Europe for this workshop and in the demo we'll be uh, you know, making this trade in euros. So again, what I'm looking at here is all of the existing offers that people have put out there to ha to sell, to excuse me, to buy their Bitcoin. So other people have made offers saying, here's an offer to buy my Bitcoin. And I, as somebody who wants to sell some of my Bitcoin, can take their offer. Right, so I could click that button and take their offer. And that's very convenient for me, right? In this case, in our terminology, I would be the taker of an existing offer. And uh, that means that it's just as, as easy as it can be. I just open up BISC and I just come along and take an offer. That's great for me. Now, some of these are grayed out. Let's see what happens if I try to click on this button tells me that I don't have a matching trading account. I'll need to set up a payment account using this payment method. 
So I want to just uh, dig into a little bit of detail on this before we dive into the demo, because this is where the demo starts. So what does that mean, payment method? Well, the one that I can take is a SEPA transfer. So the single euro payments area, for those that aren't here in Europe, is uh, an extremely popular, but ubiquitous, really, um, uh, means of uh, exchanging euros across banks. Um, basically, everybody uses it. And I do have in BISC an account set up, which I'll show you in just a moment, uh, that allows me to do SEPA trading. But I don't have an account set up for these other payment methods, like, for example, Revolut. Uh, so I'm unable, those offers are uh, unavailable to me to take. But I can take this one. So let's jump over to the account tab, to the account section of the app, and I'll show you what it means when we say setting up a payment account. So manage my accounts. My national currency accounts include this one, a SEPA account. And in a moment in the demo, you're gonna see me actually fill out this form, but this is the end result of it, that I've uh, typed in my information and so on, uh, making it possible if I were to uh, make or take an offer to buy or sell Bitcoin to exchange this information with my counterparty and only with my counterparty such that they can pay me, right? If I'm selling my Bitcoin, they need this information in order to be able to send the euros to me to pay for the Bitcoin that they're buying from me. So this information doesn't go anywhere else. It's locally stored until the time that I need to share it with just my counterparty. Good, so with that uh, brief tour of this complete, let's jump into the demo. Uh, now, this is, like I mentioned a moment ago, a recorded demo uh, between myself and uh, Steve, another BIS contributor. And the reason that we pre-recorded this was so that we could fast forward through certain um, indeterminately long delays, like the Bitcoin blockchain confirmations uh, that are necessary as we make and take each other's offer. Uh, of course, that should take on the order of 10 minutes. It might take less, might take more, but we didn't want to make you wait 10 minutes or more uh, just to walk through the demo. So you'll see that those sections fast forward quickly. And of course, the other even more important reason uh, for being able to do that kind of uh, fast forwarding is for the bank transfer itself. Remember, I'm gonna be playing the seller of Bitcoin. I'm gonna sell some of my Bitcoin and Steve's gonna buy it. And when he sends me his Euro payment, uh, well, that's gonna take on the order of days because that's just how long those payments take. So of course we wanted to fast forward through that. So with that said, let's jump right in. You'll see a complete end-to-end -end trade. Okay, Chris here again. Just a moment ago, you saw that we were in the account tab and you saw a, a completely set up account. I want to actually show you here in the demonstration how we do that. And so I'm going to click on add new account. And we know that it, we want it to be a, a SEPA account. So we're going to be transacting in euros over the SEPA payment system. And I'm gonna type in my name. And you know, usually when you're doing this kind of thing, you're doing it on a website, you're sending this information to a server, to a third party, to an exchange, etc. So, you know, you should be feeling nervous right now, right? Except this information isn't going anywhere. It's only gonna live right here within my BIS client. Uh, the only time it's going to leave my machine is when I'm actually going to transact with Steve, who you'll see in a few moments. But until then, it's all local. So I'm going to paste in my IBAN. Uh, for, any, for any clever people out there, that's a fake IBAN number. <laughs> it's not my actual bank account. Um, okay. So 
and that account is an Austrian account. And I'm going to say that I accept trades from everybody in uh, the European Union. I'm not going to restrict it, but this does allow you to do that. If for some reason you didn't want to accept payments from uh, particular countries, you could uncheck those boxes and your offers would be unavailable to them and you wouldn't be able to take offers from those countries. Okay, so just uh, before we actually save this and move on, just notice this limitations. Um, so the maximum trade duration for a SEPA trade is six days. And that's because that's actually the maximum amount of time that SEPA transfers take. So sometimes they happen within just a day or two, but they uh, always resolve within six days. So when you're doing these trades, it's a good idea to, uh, you know, to, to really make the payments as quickly as possible uh, so that you don't run out that time. But you know, that's not a problem that people have very often, but that's one limitation. The other uh, limitations, we're going to talk more about this in a bit, is uh, limitations on how much this new account that I just set up can buy. So I can only buy right now 0 0.01 Bitcoin. Now I'm actually going to be selling from this account and there the limitations are higher. I can sell as much as 0 0.0625 Bitcoin. And that number will go up the longer that this account has been in existence, the longer that the network knows about this account. And the network's gonna know about this account, not by the details of the information that I just put in up here, but by a salt that's been generated in this account creation process. So that is gonna be broadcast to the network. The network's gonna know, hey, we've seen this account. We know it's been around for a while and over time, the cell limits will go up. Okay, again, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, account limits in a little bit, but that's good to know. And save account. Okay, and here it talks a bit more about those limitations and there's documentation on this uh, that you can go read in full. Okay, I understand. And it's reminding me to set up a, a password. I haven't done that in this demo app. Of course, you would want to do that in the real world. All right, so we have an account, and that means that we can now that I can now actually go make an offer to sell uh, Bitcoin. So let's do that. And uh, now I want to create an offer. So let's just talk a little bit about my use case. You know, why do why do people do this? Well, people could want to sell Bitcoin for any reason, of course. But uh, you know, one real world use case is uh, you know, you're somebody uh, trying to do just as much as you can in Bitcoin. Maybe you get paid in Bitcoin. You have most of your savings in Bitcoin, whatever the case may be, uh, you've still got to interact with uh, you know, fiat currencies. Chances are your landlord uh, wants his rent paid in euros, not in Bitcoin, right? So if we're, so let's, Take the case that you know the use case that uh, I need to pay my rent. Yeah, so I'm going to create an offer to sell enough Bitcoin uh, to pay my rent, and let's sell as much as I can with this new account. So 0 0.0625 Bitcoin, and I'm going to sell that because I'd like to just sell it right away. I'm gonna do it at 0% distance from the market price. So you have a choice in BISC, how much of a markup or how much of a premium you wanna put on your, on your offers. So you might mark up the price a little bit uh, and, and make a bit of profit from that trade because after all, you're providing quite a service. You're providing liquidity uh, to the marketplace of potential buyers who want to just show up in BISC and be able to take an offer quickly. So it makes sense that people are willing to pay a little bit extra above the market price to do that. Now, if you really want to sell quickly, you could uh, mark down the price below the market price. And you could say, look, this is a fire sale. I need the money right away and I want somebody to take it immediately. So I'm going to sell it below the market price. In my case, just for the purposes of this demo, I'm going to keep it at 0%. So we're going to sell just right at the market price, which is currently uh, 
9,206 uh, euros. Okay, so that means that I'm gonna receive 575 euros. It's also possible to uh, make a range of, uh, of the amount that you'd like to sell somewhere between a minimum, say 0 0.01, and a maximum of 0 0.065. Again, just to keep things simple, I'm gonna keep those values the same. And then uh, you as the, as the offer maker have the opportunity to set uh, the value of the security deposit that both you and uh, your taker are going to are going to contribute uh, into this trade, and you know this this is a default value, and I'm going to keep it at that default value. Um, but uh, that's just another way of letting market forces uh, do their thing. You might set the security value, or the security deposit value, much higher, say, as a signal to uh, counterparties out there that you're really serious. You're not gonna mess around. You're not gonna lose that security deposit because it's really valuable. You're gonna be a good counterparty and you're gonna complete this trade on time and so on and so forth. Uh, so that, that's just another uh, factor that you, can, that you can figure in. Again, I'm just gonna leave it at the default. And then, uh, and then here's choosing my trade fee currency. You have an option in BISC to pay your, tra your BISC trading fees in Bitcoin or in BSQ, which is a colored coin that we built on top of Bitcoin that helps fund internally uh, the BISC DAO. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this demo to explain all of that. I'm gonna leave it Bitcoin here, uh, but you can find out all about that uh, in our documentation on our website and so on. Okay, so let's take the next step. So this interstitial is just telling us about the necessity of the security deposit because it's about to ask us to contribute that security deposit. So I understand that that's necessary. It gives me all the details. So I'm about to I'm about to uh, put together all the funds for this trade, which are going to include the 0 0.0625 Bitcoin that I actually want to sell. My security deposit again, 23% of that value, so that's gonna be 0 0.01 Bitcoin and change. My trading fee, just a few thousand sats, and the mining fee that I'm gonna pay. Uh, trading fees happen to be, or excuse me, Bitcoin mining fees happen to be pretty low right now. So that's also a pretty low value. Okay, so let's close that. This is how much I'm gonna to have to contribute overall. 0.077 Bitcoin. And before starting this demo, I funded this Bitcoin wallet with 0.2 Bitcoin from a different external wallet. We'll talk more about this in a bit as Steve plays the taker. Steve is gonna, pl is gonna play the, the role of a, a relative newbie to BISC uh, doing his first trade and he's going to talk more about what it means uh, to pay a security deposit. That you need to have a little bit of Bitcoin in order to buy or sell Bitcoin with BISC. He'll talk more about that in a minute. For the moment, you can just notice I already have 0 0.2 Bitcoin in my BISC wallet. So I've got plenty for you know, the amount that I want to sell and my security deposit. So I'm going to transfer those funds from my BISC wallet into this trade wallet. All right, your trading wallet was sufficiently funded with the same amount that we just saw, 0 0.77. And now we have a final confirmation screen. Let's review, this is the amount, that's how much I'm gonna be paid in euros for selling that amount of Bitcoin, etc. Everything that we just went through and do I want to confirm? Yes. Okay, my offer has been published. So let's go have a look at what that means. I'm gonna jump into the portfolio section of, this, of the uh, application. There we are. And my open offers 
includes that offer that I just created. If I wanted to temporarily disable that, I can check this box and so on. If I decide that I don't want to do this offer at all, I can uh, delete it. Of course, I would lose my trading fee when I do that. Um, but you have those options available. And now if we uh, jump over to actually see that offer in the, in the marketplace, right? If I click on buy Bitcoin, now if I think, well, who's gonna see this? I just placed an offer to sell my Bitcoin. So somebody who wants to buy Bitcoin would see that offer to sell, right? So let's see if we can find it. Ah, we don't see it because I'm looking only at USD. So let's look at Euro offers. And there it is right at the top. So looks like it published just fine. And now let's uh, just take a look at this, right? You can see, so a moment ago, I had exactly 0 0.2 Bitcoin in my available balance. And now that's split, I have a reserved balance now. So those funds that I just contributed to that trading wallet, well, they're unavailable for use right now, right? I can still do whatever I want with the 0 0.12 that are left over, but this is reserved until that trade gets taken or until uh, such time that's, uh, uh, that I you know, disable it or what have you. Okay, and in the meantime, another few offers are showing up and, uh, and they're, they're beating my price. They're coming in under the market price. Very interesting, right? So now I'm actually going to go create another offer right now. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because uh, it, just as a best practice, um, when I'm creating a larger offer, I, like many other BISC users, often also create a smaller offer. And I'm gonna create a smaller offer for 0 0.01 Bitcoin. Again, I'll, just for the purposes of simplicity, I'll do it at uh, zero. Well, you know what? Actually, what people do is they mark this up a little bit. So I'm gonna create a 5% above market price, uh, which will get me 97 euros. And uh, the reason that I'm gonna do this, it has to do with the account limits that I mentioned before. We create those account limits as a protection against uh, bank account scammers. We can talk more about this later. And again, it's all documented. This is a very important protection in BISC. And um, what that means is that brand new users to BISC uh, can only purchase 0 0.01 Bitcoin their first time out. Uh, and as they do that, and they complete the trade successfully, their account gets signed, uh, as we say, by their counterparty, and their limits start to go up. And their limits also continue to go up as their account ages, as it's been known by the network. Uh, for longer and longer periods of time. So as a service to the larger BISC community, uh, it's a good idea to create these small offers. And it's also a way of just making a few bucks, right? So this is something that people commonly do. I'm gonna do this and we'll see in a moment uh, when we switch over to Steve, who again is gonna play the role of a brand new BISC user. This is gonna be the trade that he's gonna take. Okay, so let's do that. We'll run through all the same uh, pop-ups and interstitials that we saw a moment ago about security deposits and all the de details of what's going to get contributed to the trading wallet. And I'm ready to do it. So transfer funds and close. Okay, so final review. Looks good. Confirm. Okay, so my offer has just been published. Good. Let's have a look at it. So there's the one, the larger one that we published earlier, 0 0.065. And there's the smaller one that we just published.
Okay, so with those offers now published, we're ready to switch over to Steve's side and he'll play the taker of my offers. He'll play the buyer of my Bitcoin as a brand new disk user. Okay, so Steve, take it away. All right, thank you, Chris. So uh, as Chris mentioned, I am a relative newbie with Bitcoin. I've made some, dabbled and made some trades on local Bitcoins before they had KYC, but lately I've been looking for another option and I uh, heard lots of great things about BISC. So here we are with a new BISC install. I have a payment account set up for SEPA. Uh, and so I'll be looking to take a SEPA offer to buy Bitcoin. Uh, if we look here at the list, I believe this is the offer that Chris just made. Um, I can't take this offer because it's above my buying limit. So my at the moment, since I just created my account this morning, my limit to buy is 0.01 Bitcoin. And this bigger offer from Chris is bigger than that. So I cannot take that, but I can take the other one that he created for 0.01 Bitcoin down here. So... I'll go ahead and do that. Take offer to buy. Uh, now, unlike Chris, uh, I do not have my uh, BISC wallet pre-funded, um, playing the part of a new user. So uh, my wallet is currently empty, uh, but I will be funding it from an external wallet, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. Uh, here, this screen is simply showing the details of the trade the amount of Bitcoin I'm buying, the price for it, uh, market price for it, the uh, amount that I'll be buying in euros, and uh, trade fee, which I'll keep uh, in Bitcoin for now as well. Now this window is simply telling me about the uh, security deposit, which I uh, both, you know, Chris paid as a seller and I'll be paying as a buyer. Uh, both this enable this uh, ensures that both the buyer and the seller have a good amount of skin in the game to make sure that they follow the trade protocol to the best of their abilities. This box is uh, breaking down the, uh, the total deposit that I'll need to make to confirm the trade. So there is the security deposit, there is the trading fee. Uh, which goes to BISC, and then there's the uh, the mining fees for uh, for the transactions uh, themselves. So uh, the total funds I need are here, 0 0.006 Bitcoin and some change, and the place the the address I need to send these funds to is here. So I'm going to hop over to my external wallet and send funds. Give me one moment. All right, I've just sent the transaction and you can see BISC has received it. All right, so uh, so at this point, I think it's worth uh, mentioning at this point, the Bitcoin that I just sent uh, is, is in the BISC wallet. I mean, it, the transaction has not been confirmed, but it is uh, going to be in the BISC wallet on, on my machine. So I'm going to say review, review the details, make sure everything is the way I expect it to be, and confirm. Now, when I hit confirm, that's when the BISC trade will actually start. And at that point, a couple things will happen in the background. Mainly, I will pay my trading fee, and both mine and Chris's security deposits will be locked in a multisig. To make all this more clear, here is an overview. These are the transactions that take place to secure and carry out our trade. On the top left is the maker fee transaction that Chris made when he published his offer to sell the 0.01 Bitcoin. 
On the bottom left is the taker fee transaction that I published just now when I took his offer. These two outputs in green are the inputs for the deposit transaction, which was published at the same time as my taker fee transaction just now. This transaction locks both of our deposit funds in a two of two multi-sig escrow. This means that only you and your trading peer have control of the Bitcoin being traded, no third parties. We'll touch on how that's possible in just a bit. Once I've sent payment, and once Chris has received it, a payout transaction will send me the Bitcoin I bought and return the security deposits that each of us put down. Okay, the deposit transaction has now confirmed. This means that Chris's security deposit, my security deposit, and the Bitcoin that Chris is selling are all now locked in a two of two multi-sig address. BISC is now showing me Chris's payment details as, as it's now safe for me to make the payment. So I will go ahead and make this payment. It's important to note here that all payments for Bitcoin, whether they are uh, with a fiat currency or an altcoin, are done out of band away from BISC. So I'll be making this payment on my phone through my banking app. Um, you would do the same regardless of whatever payment method you're using, uh, whether it be a banking payment, a, an altcoin payment like Monero or whatever, this does not know about those payments. It doesn't integrate with any of those services or blockchains. Uh, you merely tell it this when you've made the payment. So as soon as I made the payment, I will click this payment started button and the seller, Chris in this case, will mark the payment as received once he has once you can confirm that he's received it. So I've just made the payment on my phone and I'll go ahead and click payment started to confirm that I have started the payment. And at this point, Chris should have received or will shortly receive a message that I've received the payment and it'll be his job to confirm uh, that he has received the payment. Okay, so Steve made his uh, bank transfer to me uh, through the magic and power of recording a demo. We've fast forwarded through time waiting for slow banks to make their slow transfers happen. And the payment has now shown up on my side. I've checked it in my bank's mobile app payments is in fact there. Uh, I got a notification that you can see up here. BISC told me when uh, Steve started to make the payment. So that, that was the first notification. And let's click that to see that status. It's again, just telling me that they started the payment. So this, this happened when Steve actually initiated. Again, we've waited for the payment to go through. I've checked that, it, that I actually received it in my bank account. And so I'll now click confirm payment receipt. Notice here in the account balances that I've still got the Bitcoin that I'm selling and uh, my security deposit reserved. So as I confirm this, funds are gonna get released. Steve's gonna get his 0 0.0625 Bitcoin that he's buying and we're both gonna get our security deposits back. Okay, confirm. Yes, in fact, I have received the payment. I checked it on my Thanks mobile app. And we get the notification saying trade completed. So I can now withdraw my funds. And I'm gonna to choose to just keep my funds in my BISC wallet. But notice that when I do that, it's gonna shift from reserved to available. And that's just getting back my security deposit. Okay, so the trade is.
completed. Okay, now back on my end as the buyer, the Bitcoin buyer, you can see the uh, the multi-sig payout is uh, is in uh, is in progress. If we go back to the portfolio screen for the trade, you can see that the both sides have done their part. I sent my payment. Chris confirmed it, and I can now. Uh, withdraw the 0.01 Bitcoin. I think Chris might have mentioned 0.0625. It's 0.01 Bitcoin that I bought. Uh, I can keep it in my wallet, which makes it easier to use for future trades, or I can withdraw the Bitcoin to an external wallet uh, for cold storage or, or whatever you want. And that's it. I've just completed my first trade with this. Okay. Welcome back from the demo. Hope you found that valuable. And this just about brings us to a close, but before we do, there are a couple of topics that we could only really briefly touch on in the scope of this workshop session. And those are dispute resolution and account limits. Dispute resolution is all about what happens when it's not on the happy path. You saw the happy path uh, trade between Steve and myself. Everything went as to plan, per the protocol. Uh, I put up my offer, he took it, he paid me, I accepted it, he got my Bitcoin, everything works great. And that's usually the case with the vast majority of trades on BISC. But what happens if for some reason a payment is late or doesn't make it, or the seller forgets to click payment received? Any number of things can happen that are usually uh, just human error. Uh, and there needs to be a system in place to resolve those disputes. And there's a complete dispute resolution system in place with BISC, and you can find all about it, find out all about it at uh, the link given here. And also to find out more about how account limits work, uh, all the details of what the initial limits are, and how account signing works, and how account aging works. Uh, you can find out all about that there. So uh, thank you to everyone uh, attending and viewing this. And uh, I'd also like to say a, a big thanks to Philippe for all the brilliant, uh, as he calls it, Bitcoin, Bitcoin propaganda posters that we uh, used with his permission all throughout this deck. Really wonderful stuff. You can see his website linked there below. Uh, I'd encourage you to, to go use them in your own materials if you're doing something like this. Really fun. Or hang them up in your house, whatever you want to do. Um, okay, and uh, of course, a uh, uh, big thanks to the Hackers Congress and to Parallel Nepolis for putting on this great event every year. Always a pleasure. And the uh, uh, website here is uh, nokyconly.com. Is a... Uh, uh, something to really check out to, to dive deeper into um, the reasons why KYC is a bad idea and um, resources, uh, no KYC resources out there in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Of course, our, uh, BISC's own website where you can find everything you need from downloads to guides to links to all the resources in our ecosystem. And if you've got questions, you can come talk to us uh, on Keybase in the BISC team there. All right, thanks again for your attention and happy trading.